Life is unpredictable. One day we are low in the valley, struggling, just trying to get by. The next we are on the mountain, celebrating our victories. But there is one thing in our lives that is certain. God is always there. He is with us in the valley of the shadow of death. He is there every step we take. As we travel through life, there will be battles. There will be victories. No matter what we are facing, we must keep climbing and press on, trusting Him and never looking back. Our Lord will never leave us, nor forsake us. He will deliver us from the valleys. Our family took a great vacation to Arizona. And while we were there in the desert, we learned about the king of the cacti, the great saguaro cactus. It stands 50 feet tall and has about 24 arms that tower high into the sky. It lives 200 years. And it can live four years in the desert without having any new rain. It can do this because of its elaborate storage system. Its root system extends out from its base 65 feet in all directions. And it gathers all the moisture in the desert and stores it so that in a dry season, in a drought, it can survive. You two and I need a spiritual storage system to make it through the dry seasons of life. Just as we need physical water, we need spiritual water. The Bible uses water as a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of God. Water is the thing that can turn a desert into a garden. We need water to live. We can only live four days without water. Our bodies are 60% water. Our brains are 70% water. And our lungs are 90% water. We need two and a half quarts of water per day in order to replenish the water we're losing just through evaporation. In the same way that we need natural water, we need spiritual water. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the blessings of God so that when we go through the desert seasons and the dryness of the valleys, we can make it. And this is what the psalmist was writing about in the great 84th Psalm, in which he begins to talk about the people of God on the pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem to worship. And he says there in verses 5 through 7, the passage that I want to share today as we talk about being blessed in the valley of Baca. He says, blessed are those whose strength is in you. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains cover it with pools. And the word pools there in Hebrew is the same word for blessings. Blessed in the valley of of Baca. They go from strength to strength till each one appears before God in Zion. That's a great thought to be able to go from strength to strength instead of going from strength to weakness, but to stay strong. The word Baca, often translated weeping or sorrow, is the Hebrew word for dry. It comes from the balsam tree of Hebrew. To go through a dry desert experience, he describes these Jewish worshipers coming up from the desert. We don't know exactly where the valley of Baca was or whether it was just a metaphor of passing on your way to the house of God, but you find yourself in a valley of Baca, a dry place, an arid place, a drought, a place of sorrow, a place of trouble, a place of difficulty. But he says you can be blessed even in the valley. You can go from strength to strength. Because you've learned to depend upon the Lord. And the word strength appears here three times. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. They go from strength to strength. Because that's the key to making it through the valley experiences and through the Baca experiences. You and I may go through that in our personal lives. We may go through a dry time in our relationship with God. Where we once had this joy and this excitement, we find ourselves in a spiritual desert. Marriages sometimes go through the valley of Baca. Difficult time. 
You may go through it with a job loss, a career change, where your whole world is suddenly turned upside down. You may go through it through the pain of divorce or the death of someone you love. And you find yourself walking through the valley of Baca, a place of sorrow, a place of sadness, a place of dryness. But water is the thing that turns the desert into a garden. And when you begin to experience the fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, and you can draw water from the well of salvation, you can go from strength to strength. You can get through that valley to the mountain peak of victory. God doesn't promise to take us out of the valley of Baca. That's usually our prayer, and that's a natural thing to do. Lord, get me out of this situation. Get me out of this problem. Get me out of this predicament. But God gives us the strength to go through the valley of Baca. That's what we need is such an inner strength that we can get through the valley of Baca and go from strength to strength until we fulfill God's destiny on our lives. Do you know when Moses came across the Red Sea, and I'm sure when he got to the other side, he thought, I'm glad that's over. After he confronted Pharaoh ten times and saw the judgments of God, the people complained about him, and then they actually got across the Red Sea when they thought we were going to be destroyed. The first thing he did was write a song. It's found in Exodus 15. It's the first song written in the Bible, and all the other songs that you'll read about are inspired and often take their theology from the great song of Moses, which is referenced again in Revelation chapter 15. And what did Moses sing about? What was he so excited about when he got through all of it? The first thing he said in his psalm in Exodus chapter 15, was the Lord is my strength. Yes. Somebody say that with me. The Lord is my strength. He is my song. He has become my salvation. Moses was singing, Lord, if you hadn't been my strength, I'd have never gotten through that. When King David had gone through all those amazing experiences and what we call the last words of David in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 33, he praises God and says, you arm me with strength and you make my way perfect. The psalmist said in Psalm 29, 11, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Have you ever come through a difficult experience in life and as you look back on it, you even wonder how you got through it? Where did that strength come from? It came from the hand of God. He armed you with strength. And he tells us in Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength you know what the word wait means, to wait upon the Lord? It means to tie yourself to God. You ever seen a tomato plant or a little vine when they grow those and they put that stake in the ground and they tie the vine to it so it'll grow? That's what the Hebrew word wait means. It means God's the stake. You're just a flimsy vine. Tie yourself to God so that when the weather comes and the rains come, you're not going to be uprooted. You're going to continue to grow. Tie yourself to God. Stay close to God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Paul prays for us. And as he prayed for believers in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, he said, I pray that God, out of his glorious riches, may strengthen you by his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And then we hear in 1 John 2 and 14, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God lives in you. God is not always going to just pull us out of the valley and take us out of the valley of Baca, but God will give us the strength in the valley of Baca that we can pass through it, that we can make it a place of springs, that with joy we can draw water from the wells of salvation and we can go from strength unto strength until we all appear before the living God and fulfill His destiny in our lives. We have the tendency to want to run away from our problems instead of living through them. Sometimes in problems can be so overwhelming, painful things, difficult seasons of sorrow. When it eclipses everything in life, you can't think about anything else. You don't hardly have an appetite. You can't concentrate on anything else. When those seasons passing through the valley baca are overwhelming, they eclipse everything in your life. There's a tendency sometimes to want to quit, to want to give up, or maybe run away from your problems. When I think of running away from problems, I think of a man who got him a brand new convertible and wanted to see how fast it would go, a big sports car, and he got on the interstate, got it up to 80, and it's just cruising smooth, pushed it up to 90. It was this smooth as it could be, 95, 
felt like he was going 20 miles an hour. Suddenly, he passed the state patrolman. He turned on the blue lights, got behind him. Instead of pulling over, the man sped up, got up to 100, and cop chased him, got up to 110. He kept trying to get away from the cop. Finally, the man realized, what am I doing? They're going to arrest me. He pulls over. And the patrolman comes up, and he's furious. He said, man, didn't you see my lights? Why didn't you pull over? And the man said, I was afraid. He said, afraid of what? He said, my wife ran off with the state patrolman last month, and I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> and we just want to run as fast as we can from our problems. The question is, where do I get the strength to pass through the valley of Baca. How can we live like that? There's a way to live going from strength unto strength. And if you listen to this psalm, there are three valuable spiritual lessons taught to us here about how to pass through the valley and to be blessed in the valley of Baca. Many people think they have to get through the valley of Baca to the blessing. No, you can be blessed in the valley. And the first thing he says is, blessed are those whose strength is in you. They go from strength to strength. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Where is your strength? What is your strength in? Is it in yourself? Is it in your talent? Is it in your wisdom and your ability to plan and work your way through every problem? Is your strength in other people? Is your strength in the economy? Exactly, what, what is the source of your strength? When you pass through the Valley of Baca in your own experience, where are you looking for help? I like the way the psalmist put it in Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He who watches over Israel will watch over your life. No harm will come to you. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. It's a powerful thing when you can say, my help comes from the Lord. My help doesn't come from Washington politics. My help doesn't come from the United States economy. My help doesn't come from the global situation. My help doesn't come from leaning on the arm of the flesh. I will lift up my eyes to the hills today. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And where do I get that strength? This, this psalm is teaching us the power of coming together with God's people for worship. It is our worship that gives us this strength. It is drawing close to God both privately and coming together as God's people. This is the place, this is the experience where we experience new strength. Listen to what he says in this psalm. He's describing God's people going to the house of God in Jerusalem to worship. How lovely. O oh Lord, is your dwelling place. He's describing the temple of God in Jerusalem. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. When we come to the house of God, we need to cry out for the living God and seek God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. When we come to the house of God, we ought to be praising God. That's what this is all about. Because it is in that praise that we get strength. Did you know that the Hebrew word for praise is the same Hebrew word for strength? Your strength will never be greater than your praise. Your power will never be greater than your worship. It is in praising God and walking with God, whether that's privately communing with Him or coming together with God's people, that the strength comes. And that's why he says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. The Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the young person who trusts in the Lord. My help comes from the Lord. And you need other people to help you get through that valley of Baca. There's strength. You need to call for other believers to pray with you, to encourage you. That's how you get through the valley of Baca, in the strength of corporate Worship. You don't have to go through that valley by yourself. Somebody will gladly walk through that valley with you and encourage you. 
Did you know that that's why we come together, why we're taught on the Lord's Day to worship together? Did you know that the word church in its purest definition in the Greek language, ekklesia, when Jesus said, upon this rock, ekklesia, to call out that God summons us to an assembly. The word church means a gathering. There's nothing individual about the church. It's a corporate thing. It's a family thing. To come together. Do you know the reason we come together is not just to worship God, but to encourage each other. Yes. The Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And if we're not careful, we're all going to be sitting at home in our pajamas watching a screen. And that's a wonderful way to reach people around the world. And when you're not able to gather but there's nothing that can substitute coming together with God's people, worshiping in spirit and in truth. When God comes down and touches His people and our hearts are lifted up so that we sit together in heavenly places and we're strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. The word encourage is the Greek word for to make strong. Let us encourage, let us make each other stronger in our Christian walk. We're going to have to be spiritually strong to survive in this world today. And the spiritual attack that's coming our way and the spiritual stress of our times and the false spirituality and the mysticism and people losing their faith, we need to encourage one another in our faith. And do so more and more, he said, as you see the day approaching. The day there means the day of Jesus' second coming. Let us encourage each other more and more. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church about worship services just like this and what should take place, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, listen to this, let everything be done for the strengthening of the church. Let every song, every message, every prayer, every ministry, let everything be done for the strengthening of the church. We should never do anything that weakens another Christian. We should never do anything or say one word that ever discourages a brother or sister in their walk with Christ. We should never offer one criticism of God's church. Let everything be done for the strengthening of the church. You say, what if I have a complaint? Keep it to yourself and send the rest of us an encouragement. <laughs> you, who is the half-brother of Jesus, that little letter right before the book of Revelation that kind of sticks together and you don't even know it's in the Bible, the little letter of Jude. He was Jesus' half-brother, grew up with Jesus, didn't accept him as Messiah until after the Lord's resurrection. In Jude, verse 20, that little letter, he says, Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. If there was ever a day in which we need to do that, yeah. that is today. Our children, they need to be built up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, notice he didn't say, build yourself up, but build yourselves up. Because it's plural. It's coming together with God's people. It's coming together with God's family. It's when we go to the house of God and we worship God that we become stronger on the inside. I was reading the book of Proverbs recently for my devotions, and a proverb just struck me with great impact and importance. Proverbs 24:10. If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? is your strength. Sometimes we say, but the problem is too great. That's not the issue. The issue is the power's too small. The stress is too great to bear. That's not the issue. The issue is the strength is too small. Spiritual strength is like natural strength. It has to be replenished. And we come together to worship, to grow stronger in the Lord and in His mighty power. Great stress has got to be equaled with great strength. Yes. Great pressure around us has got to be equaled with great power within us. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. 
Don Bennett, a Seattle businessman, made it his goal to climb Mount Rainier in Washington State. I've been to Mount Rainier, never been to the summit, been high up on it. It's the tallest mountain in the United States, 14,410 feet, covered with snow and ice. Nothing unique about his story. Many people have climbed to the summit of Mount Rainier. But what made his story unique and made it national news is he's the first amputee to climb to the summit. One leg and two crutches, he climbed to the top, tall, top of the tallest mountain in the United States. In an interview afterwards, because it's an extraordinary story, the person interviewing asked, what is the greatest lesson you learned on the climb? He said, to appreciate the value of my team. I would have never made it to the top without the people who helped me get there. I couldn't get there by myself, he said, with one leg and two crutches, but I got there with their help. And you're not going to make it through the Valley of Baca by yourself. And the good news is you don't have to be by yourself. Amen. You don't have to keep it all to yourself. Find brothers and sisters who love you, who care about you, who will pray for you, who will encourage you, who will nurture you. The strength in the valley often flows when God's people come together in worship. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Don't look to anybody else. Don't look to anything else. Don't get your hopes in anything material. Set your eyes upon the hill and walk into that valley of bitterness and sorrow and weeping and dryness, say, my help comes from the Lord. Somebody say it with me. My help comes from the Lord. Say it again. My help comes from the Lord. The second great lesson he teaches us about passing through the valley of Baca and being blessed is when he says, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. When we're in the valley of Baca, it's important to pass through it and not get stuck in it. Because on the other side of every valley, there's a mountain peak of victory and blessing waiting us. Amen. But to get through the valley, you have to set your heart on pilgrimage. When you're in a valley, it's easy to focus only on the valley because it's overwhelming. The problems are overwhelming. They just demand our constant attention. And so we lose sight of where we're going. To get through the valley, you have to set your heart on pilgrimage, not set your attention on the problem. Set your focus on the promise. Have a purpose in front of you that you're always looking at so that you pass through the valley and you don't stop in the valley or get stuck in the valley or give up in the valley and start telling yourselves, this is as good as my life is going to be. Things are never going to change. That's because you're looking at the valley. You've set your heart on the valley. Set your heart on pilgrimage and say, I'm going somewhere. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going somewhere. I have an undergraduate degree in psychology, which is basically a worthless degree. <laughs> the only thing worse is a sociology degree. You've hit an all-time low, and that's the only thing you can find in the catalog. But those two degrees, sociology and psychology, they're, they're good degrees if we go on to a master's degree in community service or counseling. They're foundational degrees. So we have to have a practical application. So I, got a master's in counseling from the University of Georgia. During the training and study of psychology, I was always fascinated with the theories of personality, the theories of human personality, why we do what we do. And I'm sure you ask yourself, why do I do what do I do? Why do I act like this? What motivates human behavior? And there are a lot of different theories. And out of those theories come the models of counseling. One of the early developers of what is now called the modern force of psychology was a man back in the early 1900s, a man by the name of Sigmund Freud. I'm sure everybody here has heard of Sigmund Freud. Well, Freud's theory of personality development was basically the first five years of your life and the conflicts with your parents and the, and the issues you're going through as a child in development basically determine who you are. And from that point of your life, you are being living out 
what happened in your childhood. Maybe struggling with it, maybe unresolved issues there. And in psychoanalysis, when you're going through a problem in the present, they're always looking back at the past saying, well, where is the root from the past? Now, it's amazing to me how many people don't like Sigmund Freud, and so I would never believe in Sigmund Freud. But I think just about everybody I've met believes the teachings of Sigmund Freud. Most Christians will use that. Well, you've got to work for your past. And even as a counselor, I'm amazed at in conversations I have with people, they always want to bring up the past because in their minds they believe that the reason they do what they do today is because they are being pushed by the past. But now Freud had a student who began to take a different view. He said maybe there's a more hopeful way of looking at humanity. His name was Carl Jung. And Carl Jung developed a different view. He didn't discount that our early childhood is important. But he didn't buy in that the first five years determines the rest of your life. That's about as depressing as it gets. You mean to tell me I did all my living the first five years and I got that's going to make me miserable for the rest of my life? So Jung had a much more optimistic or hopeful view of humanity. And he came up with a very different theory, and it shaped the way that he did counseling and therapy. He said that human behavior is not being pushed by the past. It's being pulled by the future. So he said human nature is purposeful in nature, that we tend to go toward a purpose. And if people have a purpose they will go toward that purpose. He used the term teleological. I remember the first time I read that, I thought, what in the world does that mean? That human behavior is teleological in nature. Well, I started taking two years of Greek my last year of college, and now figured out what that word meant. That's the Greek word teleos. That means a goal or a purpose, the completion or the reaching of a goal. It's the word Jesus used in Matthew 5, verse 48. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The word perfect is teleos. It means to be complete, to be mature, to arrive at God's ultimate goal and purpose for your life. And I believe Freud stumbled upon what Jesus said. When you're in the valley of Baca, you're not there simply because of unresolved issues in the past that you have to focus on, and you don't have to focus on the present. Where you're going is more important than where you've been and where you are. But if you have a purpose, a teleos, and begin to set your heart on that purpose, as you begin to pursue that purpose, you will naturally pass through the valley of Baca on to the next season that God has in your life, your calling, and your destiny. Let's don't get stuck in the valley of Baca. Let's set our hearts on pilgrimage and go to the next place God has for us. Maybe the valley of Baca for you is a valley of defeat like King David went through a moral failure. Maybe you've been through a failure or a business failure. You've got to set your heart on pilgrimage. Stop setting your heart on the failure and set your heart on your future. Maybe the valley of Baca for you is debt. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your career has changed. Maybe everything you've got in education and training in, they don't have any jobs anymore. You've got to set your heart on a new place of service in the world. You've got to take your heart off the hopelessness you feel and set your heart on the hope God has for you. Maybe the Valley of Baca view is a divorce. The marriage of your dreams has been shattered. It no fault of yours. Your, your whole life has come unraveled. There are very few things in life that are as painful for people and families and children as divorce. It leaves people devastated and hopeless and feeling like things will never change. They can never have what they have. They've lost something for good. You've got to set your heart on pilgrimage and move from this despair to the great hope that God has for you. Maybe for you, the Valley of Baca is death. Maybe someone has died or in, is close to you and your heart is so full of grief, you've got to move from the place of grief to grace. Set your heart on the place that God has for you. Don't look at the valley. Quit letting the valley eclipse every moment of your attention. Look up today. Set your heart on pilgrimage and get moving. God has something great in your life ahead of you through this valley. Praise the Lord. 
To be blessed in the valley of Baca, in the valley of weeping, in the valley of sorrow, you have to set your strength on the Lord. My help comes from Him. Blessed are those whose strength is in Him. And you've got to set your heart on pilgrimage. And the third thing you and I have to do is make it a place of springs. That's what he says. As they pass through this bitter, dry experience of life, they make it a place of springs. In the Hebrew, you can also translate it, they dig a well. And the reason you can dig a well in Baca is because God has supplied water for you. He'll provide the water the symbol of the Holy Spirit, the blessing you need so that you don't perish in the valley of Baca. Make it a place of springs. What a paradox. Make a desert a garden. When I go into prisons and do prison ministry with Mike Parker and our band, something the Lord gave me to share with those men and women a few years ago was that don't ever become this prison. Don't ever become this prison. Don't ever become that uniform they put on you. You can make this prison, I'll tell them, what you want it to be. You can make it a place of racism and violence and hatred and hopelessness. Or you can take the gospel you're hearing, begin to read the word, begin to pray together. You don't have to hate each other. You can love each other. You don't have to ra have racism. You can treat each other as brothers and sisters. You don't have to have hopelessness. You can have hope. It's up to you what you make out of it. I like that phrase. They make it a place of springs. You and I may be walking through the most difficult experience of life, but we can make it what we want to make it. We can make it a desert and just focus on the bitterness and the dryness, or we can dig a well and tap into the great joy and power of the Holy Spirit and make it a garden of worship. Make it what you want it to be. The autumn rains cover it with pools. The word pools there is blessing. In other words, God is sending his blessing down so that you can dig away. You can draw from the water of God. You can draw from the life of God. The water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of the blessings of God. In, in the most barren place of life, you can tap into the blessings of God, and God will pour out a new blessing upon you. You can be blessed even in the valley of Baca. And the water is the symbol of the Holy Spirit coming. And all through the scripture we read. I love the way Isaiah put it in Isaiah 12 and 3. With joy, we draw water from the wells of salvation. Draw out of your relationship with God. Draw out of his blessings. Draw out of his goodness. Tap into God's grace in your heart when you're going through the valley. And stop depending on your own power. With joy, we draw water today from the wells of salvation. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18, God says, I'm making a way through the desert and streams in the waste land. God provide a stream today in people's wasteland is my prayer. I like the way he said it in Isaiah 44, verse 3, when the Lord says, I will pour water on the thirsty land. Anybody thirsty here for an outpouring of God's blessing on your life? God says, I'll pour water out on the thirsty land. I will pour out my blessings on the dry ground. Then he says, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, and I will pour out my blessing on your descendants. I claim that for my children today. I hope you will, that God will pour out not only his spirit upon me, but upon my offspring and his blessing upon my children. You can live a, such a blessed life that that blessing on your life will affect generations to come. In Ezekiel chapter 30, Five in verse 24, the Lord says, I will send showers in seasons. There will be showers of blessing. Anybody need a shower of blessing today? Growing up in church, we used to sing a hymn, There shall be showers of blessing. That's all I remember of it. But I like that part. That part stuck with me. I didn't even know it was in the Bible. God will send a shower of blessing down in the valley of Baca. Jesus, one day, when he met the woman at the well, at a physical jet well that had been dug by Jacob, the patriarch of the Old Testament, alone in this conversation, she offered him water. But he said to her in John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. 
The water of this world will not satisfy. It will not give you the hope, the strength, the blessing you need. You, you can't drink from the wells of this world. You will continue to thirst. It will, there's nothing the world offers that will ever satisfy you spiritually and give your life fulfillment. Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water I give you, you'll never thirst. It will become in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You know how the Bible ends? It ends in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, with an invitation. Let him who is thirsty come, and whoever wishes, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life. Toward the end of Jesus' ministry, he went up to Jerusalem for the great festival of tabernacles. A week-long celebration, and on the eighth day, the last day, the great day of the festival, right downtown Jerusalem in the heart of the temple, the priests were leading the worship service. Jesus stood in the temple courts. This is found in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 38. And as Jesus watched the rituals of the tabernacle festival, he realized that these people were going through the ritual of the ceremony, but they didn't really know God they were spiritually empty. They had no fulfillment. And in the middle of the service, the Bible says in John's gospel, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried in a loud voice. You know, I don't mind getting loud every now and again when I preach if it's important. He stood up in the middle of that worship with a loud voice. And he said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. For out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. I'll tell you, when I come to the house of God, I'm not interested in ritualism. As a Christian, I'm not interested in traditionalism. When I come to the house of God, I want to draw water from the wells of salvation. I come with a thirsty heart. Lord, pour out your spirit upon me that out of my innermost being shall flow a river of living water. I want to be so full of the spirit that the spirit flows out. Out of me to others. You may be passing through the worst valley of your life, the most difficult, dry, barren, painful experience of life. You don't have to stay in the valley. You don't have to give up in the valley. You can be blessed in the valley. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Set your heart on pilgrimage today. Look at where you're going, not where you are, and draw water today. Say, Lord, I'm thirsty. I'm going to dig a well. I'm going to draw from the water and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, my help comes from you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me for prayer this morning? Do you find yourself in the valley of Baca? You can go from strength to strength. You can receive such strength today. When the Lord fills you again with the water of the Spirit, when the Lord pours His Spirit upon you like water, the Holy Spirit just showers a blessing. Isn't that a beautiful picture? God says there will be showers of blessing. Lord, send that on me today. Maybe your prayer. Lord, send that on my business. Send that shower of blessing on my children today. Send that shower of blessing, Lord, down on me. And refresh me in this valley so the Lord I may go from strength unto strength until one day I appear before you in heaven. I don't think this service would be complete if I didn't give you an opportunity to pray and to join me in prayer. Is anybody thirsty here today? Does anybody need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit? Does anybody need God to shower a blessing down on them? As we sing a chorus, I want you to come. I'm going to open this altar for prayer for a few minutes. If you're not a Christian, I invite you to come. Listen to Jesus' invitation. If you drink of this water, you, you drink of the water of religion, you're going to thirst again. It's not going to satisfy you. But if you drink of the water that Jesus gives you, you'll have everlasting life. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you need God to shower a blessing on you today? Are you thirsty today? Have you been looking to the wrong thing for your help? I long to Did you want to come in the house of God? In your Praise presence. Him and say, Lord, my help comes from you. My help 
comes My from the Lord. My soul will wait for you. Lord, pour out your spirit in this place. Father, draw me nearer. Draw me nearer to the beauty of your holiness. Let's worship the Lord as the psalmist said. Let's ever be praising Lord, God in God's time. I thirst for you. I want our elders to join me here and your wives and our altar ministers. Would you come and would you lay hands upon people and encourage them? Encourage them today in their walk and their faith. Pray with them. pray today that you'll send showers of blessing upon every person at this altar today. People who need to be refreshed by your spirit so they can go from strength unto strength. I pray, Lord God, that you'll give people a sense of purpose in that valley. Today they could set their heart on pilgrimage. They could look beyond that valley to the promise you have for them. We come, Lord, with thirsty souls today. Fill us with the power of your spirit. Rain, showers of blessing. Send the early and the latter rain of your spirit upon us. Fill up the wells in our souls so that even in the valley we can dig a well. We can draw water from the well of salvation and find such an inner strength. We can say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come upon us as the rain of God from heaven and refresh our souls. Hallelujah. Teach us to wait on you, Lord. Teach us to trust you. Teach us to hold fast to you in the midst of the valley that we may go from strength unto strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It has been great to share this time of worship with you. The psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Sunday is the day that we gather to worship the Lord as we begin our week together. It's amazing to me how refreshed we are spiritually, and what strength we gain when we come together to worship the Lord. I ask for your prayers for me and the pastoral staff and the entire ministry of our church that we would continue to know and to do the will of God. I also appreciate the support that you give to the church as you're able to help the church with tithes and offerings as the Lord leads you. Finally, it is incumbent upon all of us to become evangelists. Now, I know sometimes that may feel intimidating for all of us. We might not even feel qualified to share our faith, but we are. We're all living witnesses of Jesus Christ. Take this worship service, the music, the prayers, the Word of God that is shared, and share them with your friends and those who need the Lord. Again, thank you for being a part of this great worship service today, and I pray God's richest blessings on you as you begin a new week.